Hi. In a previous mathematical talk, I said some scary things about numbers. So let's now do some scary things with the real numbers. Now, the name real is probably chosen to be really evocative. We have no evidence these are the numbers that nature uses or how the universe is built. These are the numbers that we most commonly use as mathematicians to represent quantities like height, weight, things like that, that have many possible intermediate values. The thing I said that was quite scary about the real numbers is that there's many, many more of them than the rationals, and they are built essentially to patch holes in the rational numbers. So basically, the rational numbers are a set of numbers that seem harmless, just ratios of integers, yet they have more holes than thing. And that is amazing. And that I actually want to work with you using set theory. So now the ration, let's define a few terms. For the duration of this talk, the natural numbers are defined as the set 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. So I'm starting at 1, not 0, and it's just every possible integer. If an integer is in the natural numbers, then it plus 1 is also in the natural numbers. That's what the dot, dot, dot means. So this is already an infinite set. And it has the weird properties that infinite sets have. For instance, there's just as many even natural numbers as there are natural numbers. We can easily build a map from the even numbers onto the natural numbers. Just divide them by two and you get back every single number. So it basically densifies them. So that is actually the defining property of infinite sets, that they can be mapped onto from subsets of their self. Now, not every subset can do this, but if any subset can do it, or proper subset, that's not the whole thing, then you have an infinite set. So this scary property is the defining property of infinite. Now, the rational numbers are just defined as every ratio such that a is an integer and b is a natural number. The integers are just the natural numbers plus zero plus all the negative numbers. So that's not really a big difference. And again, the integers is a set that is the same size as the natural numbers. It is easy to build an onto map from the natural numbers to the integers. So they're very similar sets from a very blurry point of view. Now, obviously we can't do this division in the um, integers because we cannot divide things, we cannot divide one by three in the integers. So one third is a fraction and we basically say Q has, um, we clear the denominators that we basically can make this, um, we can basically agree not to say two sixths when we mean one third. If there's any common integer portion, we tend to divide it out. So we consider two numbers, ident two rational numbers identical if AD equals BC. So really these are pairs. And each pair is considered equivalent if uh, this holds. Or equivalently, we can just say, add a condition here in this set that the greatest common divisor of A and B is one. So if we add this into this constructor, which is called a comprehension in mathematics and also in Python, that there is no integer greater than one that divides into both, then we get this as a nice unique set and don't need to use equivalence classes. So this is the rational numbers now. We'll say it's all the reduced fractions. Now the reals, um, we can use basically the high school definition of them. It's basically numbers that have decimal expansions. Let's only look at the reals in the interval zero to one, that's as many of them as we need. And we're just trying to show there's a lot of them, so leaving some out isn't a problem. And it's basically, for the purpose of this talk, it's defined as all the, decim all the things we can write as decimal expansions, starting with zero and adding digits. Like this might be how we write a third, or we might write a tenth like this, and so on. Now, we have our two sets. We'll use this as our fragment of the reals and this as our rational numbers. We want to show that this set is much larger than this set. To do that, we need some tools for set theory. What we need is Cantor's theorem. 
Now, we define the power set of any set, which is written in this case as 2 to the s, is defined as all of the, well, let's make this 2 to the a. It's all the s contained in a as a set. So for instance, if our set is 0, 1, using the squiggly brace, then 2 to the 0, 1 is the empty set, the set containing 0, the set containing 1, and the whole shebang 0, 1. This is every possible subset of this set, and this is the power set. Now, the notation is again evocative that this is a set of size 2, this is a set of size 4. So for finite sets, a set of size n has a power set of 2 to the n. Cantor's theorem is that there is no onto map from a to 2 to the a. We interpret that as being 2 to the a is larger than a. Because we said two sets have similar sizes if one can be mapped onto the other. If one cannot be mapped to the other, then the one we can't map onto is larger. That's an interpretation of this statement. So how do we prove that? Well, it's, it's a really cute little proof. We say if there is such a map, exhibit it. So we force the hand of the person making the claim or the, the thing. We say, well, suppose there is an f from a to 2 to the a on 2. And we don't care if it hits sets multiple times. That's fine. Let it overcount. We say it can't even hit all of them. Well, we use this function. So we say, give me that function. And we use it to construct a problem. Now, the problem we're con going to construct is this set called D. And it's defined as all the sets in A such that x, sorry, all the elements of A such that x is not in f of x. A is a set of elements. f is mapping from A to subsets of A. So this is checking if an element is in a set, subset of A. So this is a sensible little statement. This is called a restricted comprehension because we're very careful that the thing we're defining D does not appear on the right hand side. Only quantities that are previously existing are allowed in this. So this is um, a set. It's a subset of uh, A. And we built it using the axiom of limited comprehension. So if we're doing these ZF axioms of set theory, that is assumed to be a legitimate construction. So it says if we had F, then D is allowed, you can allow to construct D. That's one of the rules of set theory. I've not listed all the rules. There's about 10 to make them work. That is one of the rules. What we're going to show is that D has a problem, cannot exist. Because the construction rule from F to D was one of the principles of our system, again, the axiom of limited comprehension, it means if D can't exist, then f must have already been non-existent. And we just assumed the existence of f. And so we're now falsifying that assumption. Well, why can't d exist? It's basically, suppose f of x equals d. And that's because f is onto. It ha some element has to hit d. That's, that was under the onto assumption. Well, is x in d or not? Well, that's a real problem. Because if, um, if x is in d, Sorry, I said that wrong. It's, it's all the, the set is defined as all the elements that aren't in the image. I, so, sorry, this is supposed to be not in the whole time. If x is in D, then this reversal statement says, well, no, x shouldn't be in D for that very reason. If, if x is not in D, then it should go in D. So basically, you get x in D implies x not in D by this definition here, now corrected x not member of f of x, and x not in d implies x in d. So basically, whichever of these two terms, it, neither of these two is satisfiable. These are predicates we're allowed to run over sets according to our axioms. So the fact that neither of these terms is satisfiable means that d doesn't exist, means that f doesn't exist by transitory back. Basically, then we've established Cantor's theorem that the power set is always a larger set than the set we started with. And 
this works for any set, including the um, natural numbers. So we know as a side effect that 2 to the n is a bigger set than n, a much bigger set. Now, how are we going to exploit that? Our plan is we're going to map 0, 1 onto 2 to the n, showing that 0, 1 is at least as big as 2 to the n, and that will basically nearly complete our proof. So let's do that part. So here's our mapping scheme. It's actually quite simple. We take a decimal expansion from here, and I'm going to assume that this is zeros going on, though obviously the decimal expansions could have, in general, can have zeros and ones forever. But I'm going to assume that these are the only two ones in this example. What I'm going to do is I'm going to number these points after the decimal point. So this is the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one. And I'm just going to say this decimal expansion by my f represents the set 2, 3. My scheme is the natural numbers that have the natural number column names that have ones under them are elements of the set, everything isn't. So this gives us a map. This gives us a map F from the 0, 1 interval to 2 to the n, the set of all subsets of the natural numbers that's on 2, which means 0, 1 is at least as big as 2 to the n. Okay, now we know by Cantor's theorem, this is strictly, 2 to the n is strictly larger than n, and then we're going to show that n is about the same size as q. Then by transitivity, we get 0, 1 is much greater than q, and 0, 1, um, you know, it, it's certainly, it's a subset of R, so R is certainly no smaller. In fact, really, in set theory terms, these have the same size. It's easy to build a map from this to that. Um, like, the logit function will do that. There's even continuous functions that do this. So this is not too surprising. So, and that will complete our claim that R, the real numbers, is very much sorry, no greater or equal here, because we have this strict one there, is greater than Q, and we'll be done. So the only thing that remains to show for this construction is that N and Q are about the same size. This part was by Cantor's theorem. This part was by a construction of F. So this is the only part that's missing. That part we can thankfully do graphically. And all it is... Um, I'm going to basically just arrange all of these pairs on a grid. And what I can do is um, A, I'm going to allow it to go negative, and B, I actually keep above zero, so I don't even use this lower part. And what I can do is I can number all these points, which again are all the possible fractions. I'm not even bothering to get them in the reduced form, so I'm double counting some points, which is fine, because I'm, I'm showing that Q is no bigger than the N, so the fact that N maps onto it multiple times isn't a problem. All I need to do is number these points. I'm going to start at this point here, which is at coordinates 0, 1, and I'm just going to turtle around. And I could write a formula for this curve. It's just run back and forth until you hit it. And this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, this is 4, this is 5. So I can cover every pair of points where A has sign and B doesn't by a counting of the natural numbers. And this will eventually exhaust the entire plane because any point that's a finite distance, eventually this turtle back and forth hits it. So we can exhibit a function that maps n onto q. So we get this last bit that n is um, at least as big 
Q, completing the proof. And so again, the statement to be made is there are more real numbers than rational numbers. Now, you might think in Cantor's argument, you've only shown there's one more number. Well, it's, there's a lot more numbers. That's what's going wrong. And that is sort of the exoticness of the real numbers. Even if you find infinite sets like the natural numbers disturbing, well, you're going to find the real numbers even more disturbing because there's many, many more of them. It's a completely different notion of infinity. What I want to do next is run through this again with a different definition of the reals to back up that statement that there are more, that the real numbers are holes in the rationals. So I just want to show a different formulation of the reals that expresses them as holes in the rational numbers plus the rational numbers. Okay, just finishing up, trying to clean this board up a little. So up till now we've established that there are many more real numbers than rational numbers. The next point I want to make, which is almost sailing the other direction, is the real numbers are essentially holes in the rational numbers plus the rational numbers. And we showed the real numbers last as decimal expansion, so we haven't shown them in that form as holes in the rational numbers. So let's go ahead and um, show them in this form. So let's define the real numbers a different way. They are pairs of sets, L, and R such that both not empty that such that L union R equals the rationals. So L and R are a partition of the rationals and they're because they cover the rationals and also we're going to assume that their intersection is empty. So every rational number is either an L or R, and every single A and L, B and R implies A less than B. So every element of L is to the left of every element of R. They're all less. So it's a, basically we split the rationals at some cut. There's a bunch on the left, a bunch on the right. These are called Dedekind cuts. Now, we're also going to say that um, L has no greatest element. So that means, very simply, if we're splitting the rational numbers at 5, we don't allow 5 to be in L, we put it in R. So it's just getting rid of a little redundancy. So this is not actually a very important element of the definition. It's probably left off some formulations. This is the classic definition of the real numbers, not as decimal expansions, but as Dedekind cuts. And basically, the number is what's the point right in between L and R? That's the number. Now, the st here's one that's going to cause us trouble. Let's have an example L. Yeah, it's probably a good idea to switch colors anyway. Example L defined as all of the x in Q such that x times x is less than 2. And R defined as all the x in Q such that x times x is greater than or equal to 2. This is a cut that as, as, um, obeys all these four properties. So this is a valid example cut. And this cut basically represents square root of 2. Now, the only thing I need to show is that this cut, in addition to being a real number or a dedicate cut, is a whole. What I'm going to show is that square root of 2 for this example is not in L and is not in R. So square root of 2, which is a solution to x times x equals 2, is not in either of these sets. Therefore, since these cover all the rational numbers, it's not a rational number. Well, it's clearly not in L. That's by design. If x times x, if there was an x that's a rational number that's such as x times x equals 2, it wouldn't allow, be allowed in L. So if it's anywhere, it's in R. 
So let's again do a proof by contradiction. I know that's not some people's favorite form of proof, but it often it is much shorter than other forms, and shorter is less confusing. So let's suppose x times x equals square root of 2 and x and r. Well, that implies x is a rational number. That's really what I should have said. x is a rational number. So let's say, let's work with that. So x equals a over b. a and b are integers. And b is uh, greater than 0 and b minimal. This is how we're going to do the proof by contradiction. We're saying we assume we can write x, well, I'll say square root of 2. Let's be much more specific. We can write it as a over b, a and b integers, b greater than 0, b minimal such that obeys this. Well, then we get square root of 2b equals a, which in turn implies 2b squared equals a squared. This implies 2 divides into a squared, which in turn implies 2 divides into a. Because 2 is a prime number. It's not the factor of any two non-trivial integers other than 1 and 2. So if 2 divides into a squared, 2 must divide into a. This is the trick, that 2 is picked to be a prime number. So that, if 2 divides into a, then 4 divides into a squared, which means 4 divides into 2b squared. I'll take off 1, 2 here and here. 2 divides into b squared, so 2 divides into b. So 2 divides into a and 2 divides into b. So we can form a new fraction. a prime equals a over 2 is an integer. B prime, that's what it divides into means. B over 2 is another integer. A prime over B prime is another fraction. B prime is greater than 0, equal to square root of 2, violating the assumed minimality of B. So that's a contradiction. We can't produce a minimal ratio. Non-negative integers have minimals. Any set of non-negative integers, there's a minimal one. So if, even if there's a whole series of fractions, there's one that's minimal. So it was, this minimality is violated, which means we can't write this any way whatsoever. So square root of 2 is not a rational number. There's a specific example of a real number that's not a rational. That's not enough to show there's more real numbers than rationals, because as we've seen infinite sets, we can add and remove elements without changing size very much. But in addition to being very many more real numbers than rationals, here's one that specifically isn't. Now, each one of these LR pairs is either a rational number. If um, the right-hand side has a minimal element, then it's a rational number. And there's other reals, like this one, where R doesn't have a minimal element. And for this exact one, where this one, r does not have a minimal element. Because if y, sorry, and r is a minimal element, well then y minus epsilon for sufficiently small epsilon is also an r, as long as it doesn't, basically, we're some distance away from root 2, and we can basically build a number at half that distance. So there's, um, this one is an example of a whole. Now, so every real number is either a rational number or something new. The something new are these holes, and it says basically there are more holes than rational numbers, which is what we established before, that there are very, more, very many more reals than rationals. So the explicit exhibition of this is to show that this form is a whole. Because this whole is not in the set, this set has no greatest element. That's why we call it a whole. So L and R miss each other by this missing element that's not even in the rationals. And that's what I mean by the rationals are a set that has more holes in it than elements in it. Because we've proven the holes are real numbers, and there's, the real numbers are the holes, exactly that correspondence. And 
We know there's very many more real numbers than rationals by our previous uh, work on this deck. Or, sorry, by our previous work on this uh, light board. So that is some of the tear that is the foundations of mathematics. I mean, in computers, we use floating point numbers to approximate the reals, but as you can see, they're pretty odd things.